this class is going to be um, really because this parsha deals with the offerings. Uh, Leviticus is a very important book. All Jewish children, when they're young, this is the book that they start in their studies. Um, it is uh, the, really the quintessential law, a uh, book of law. I mean, of the Torah that has been written is, is especially written here in Leviticus. God called Moshe. He says that he called Moshe, and the reason why is it seems that this is event of God calling Moshe to come is event after the temple has been erected and Shekinah of God is already there in such an awesome and fearsome place that they just say that Moshe was not, uh, he was a bit hesitant to be in the presence of Hashem, just really overwhelming. I had to bring him in, call him in. They just if God were Hashem spoke with a voice, the whole earth like, like a earthquake. But this is not how he spoke to Moshe. He called out to Moshe um, through divine inspiration, and Moshe knew that there was instructions that he needed to be given. The instructions are as follows. He says he called to Moshe, and the Lord spoke with him from the tent of meeting, Speak with the Israelites and tell them if any person from among you an offer if any person brings from among you an offering before the Lord, you must bring your offerings from cattle, sheep, and goats. Cattle, sheep, and goats. Is that the only thing that can be brought an offering though? There's one other. What is it? There's pigeon. What other kind of offering? Grain, flour, correct? Oil, wine. Lavation and uh, frankincense, right, to be mixed in with uh, the meal offering. So what we're going to do today is um, we're going to go through and read through the text, and then um, we're going to deal with some of the text as we go. I, I provided you guys with an outline, and for those who are going to be watching online, I'll provide a PDF online for you to see this. But it's a breakdown of the offering. So before we get started, what we're going to do is I'm going to break down each offering, <clears throat> what they're for, what does it mean, okay? Uh, before I do that, let me just say this. A lot of misconceptions about the sacrificial system comes from other religious interpretations of the Jewish text, which is in Hebrew. Some of the things that we've heard said and spoken is that, uh, and you've probably had this asked to you, I know I've had it asked, well, because you don't have a temple now, how do you get your sins forgiven, right? And so this, this concept that is out there, especially in Christianity, that says that the only way that your sins can be forgiven is through a sacrifice, i.e., that is why they believe that Jesus is the sacrifice of sins, correct? And that's the only way that you can have your sins forgiven. Well, clearly what we're going to learn in the book of Leviticus, that sacrifices were only for unintentional sin. So the only remedy for an intentional sin, something you willfully went out and sinned and done, was vexing your heart and crying out to Hashem and asking Him to forgive you. And then at that point you were given an opportunity to draw near to God. What is, it, what is the actual translation of the word offering? Sometimes they call it a sacrifice, but what is it really? Korban. What does korban mean? To draw near. So the whole idea of the offering was not to appease, or to appease, I'm sorry, uh, the creator of the universe. It wasn't to make the creator of the universe happy because you've bled something out and destroyed it and burned it on the altar. What was the offering for to draw, to cause the people to come near to him? That is the whole idea of the offering. And so without a temple today, we still have a temple. Where is our temple? This is our temple. And each day we offer on that altar 
offerings. We korban ourselves to Hashem in the morning when we wake up, right? First thing that we do is we acknowledge the Creator giving you life and waking you and putting your soul back in you. And then before you go to bed, there's an evening offering that you go and bring to, to Hashem. And then there is the daily offering of your regular meals that you eat and put in your mouth, that you're putting clean food on the altar to give you energy. And so we learn, and we've learned, especially in the last couple of weeks, when we talked about the inner temple, we learned very carefully that we still have this temple and have the re fiduciary responsibility to make sure that the offerings are constantly going up on it. Now let's look at this piece of paper, offerings of the temple. First, burnt offering. It's considered olah. This term does not uh, literally mean burnt offering, but that which is bought up, brought up and elevated, which is a voluntary offering of dedication to God. All of the sacrifices was to be consumed with fire. So all offerings are burnt. It doesn't mean like when your wife burns your toast and then serves it to you. That's not what it's talking about. Or your husband. I'm sorry, husbands probably are the worst cooks. I don't know of burnt offerings. Let's look at these real quick. The daily burnt offering presented at the time of the morning and the evening, uh, evening prayers, the third and the ninth hour. The, the victim was a lamb or a kid a year old. This was always accompanied by a vegetable offering, a uh, minha, or a libation of wine, which is found, I've got the references there. Next is the Sabbath burnt offering, which includes double the amount of all the elements of an ordinary daily sacrifice. Then there is the festal burnt offerings celebrated at the new moon, the Passover, Pentecost, Feast of Trumpets, or uh, Sukkot, and Feast of Trumpets, and the Day of Atonement, and Feast of Tabernacles. The occasional offerings is, number one, when a priest has it was consecrated, then when a woman's uh, during her purification, at the cleansing of the leper, when a leper comes in and he has, he's unclean, there's an offering that he comes to uh, return. At the uh, purging of uh, ceremony defilement in connection with the vow of a Nazarite. And then number five is the voluntary offering. This is also a burnt offering. These sacrifices were prescribed and uh, oblig uh, obligatory, but voluntary burnt offerings might be also made. Some of them are recorded, which involve the immolation of a large number of victims. These were the regulation of the Levitical rite. All the sacrifices were to be made under priestly auspices. Let's go down. There's the peace offering, which is called Shelamim. There are three kinds of peace offerings. A thanksgiving offering. This was in response of some great kindness of Hashem in your life. Great blessing. You come and bring a thanksgiving offering. Then the votive offering, which is a peace offering, usually for private sacrifices. Then there's the free will offering. If you're just feeling just so connected to Hashem and you're happy and you want to come bring an offering to Hashem, that is a free will offering. And in just a moment, we're going to go over and talk about how these things can be sort of translated out to our modern spirituality in the 21st century. It's, it's interesting. Then there's the sin offering. The sin offering proper is a sacrifice consisting of either a beast or a fowl or an offering offered on the altar to atone for a sin committed unwittingly. If it's unwittingly, then it's not a sin. You understand? It's defilement meaning that even if you accidentally did something you shouldn't have done, you're not really sure if it was a sin, you still defile the soul, right? And that's what... So, how do you rectify a, uh, an accidental sin? Is by bringing an altar offering coming close to Hashem. So, technically, we do this all the time when we pray a prayer of, of repentance and asking Hashem to forgive us of our sins. For example, you lay down in bed at night, and you think, wow, you know, I'm not sure I handled that the best way. And you go, Hashem, I pray that you just forgive me. You're actually drawing near to Him. The whole point of the tabernacle, the whole point of the Mishkan, was for the people to draw near to Hashem. That's all this is about. And you know, Rabbi, Wol Rabbi Wolby said this the other day in a class. I was hoping he was going to mention it here. He said, 
Why was the Torah given? Why was it given? Was the Torah given at Sinai so that the people could learn all the laws and do all the thing, all the uh, commandments? Or was the Torah given so that we would connect to Hashem? It's about connecting to Hashem. So the Mishkan is actually the next level of connecting to Hashem. In reality, later on, the great prophets will echo a, a, a message from God saying, your sacrifices are now detestable to me because your heart's not there. This has always been about what? The heart. So this is really about Kavanah, your intention. What is your intention? Hashem would much rather have your heart than you schlep over to Israel and try to go into the Temple Mount and pray right now. He wants your heart. Now, obviously, the best of both worlds, when Mashiach comes, he changes our hearts. But why is there going to be a sin offering? Can you, can you explain to me why do you think there's going to be a sin offering when the Mashiach comes? Why would there be a need for that? Unintentional sin, precisely. Because we won't have sin. We won't be intentionally sinning. The Yetzirah has been taken away at this time. So what is it for? It's for unintentional sin. And if you'll notice, if you go to Leviticus 16, um, this Leviticus 16, we'll talk, and we'll talk about this in detail later, but Leviticus 16 talks about Aaron's two sons, the death of the sons. And right after that, there is the offering for uh, Yom Kippur. And it says explicitly, that the offering given at Yom Kippur was for to atone the altar of God. Well, how does an altar sin? Can an altar sin? No, it's not about this altar sinning. It's about something possibly during that course of a year going wrong and something gets defiled on the altar. So just in case there's an atonement for that, uh, that altar. So let's deal with the next conception that that is often repeated uh, in Christianity, and we talked about this the other day, that atonement, what comes in the mind of a Christian when you say atonement? Forgiveness of sin, right? And the idea we learn in the Torah, atonement has many different applications throughout the Tanakh. So it does not mean when you see, and this shall be an atonement for you, does not mean, it's not talking about the forgiveness of sins. Sins are only forgiven when one repents to Hashem, and Hashem forgives them of their sins. Uh, all of the atonement has to do with cleansing, with purification, and with drawing near to God. Now, where did we leave off here? Um, sin offering, did we mention the sin offering proper is proper to sacrifice because it was foul? Okay, the, generally, the offer, uh, generally offered the sin offering upon discovering that one is unwittingly violated the Torah or for lesser, lesser sin unwittingly committed, wittingly committed, which would not require expulsion or death, Leviticus, the fifth chapter. Then last is the asham, or the guilt offering, a sacrifice made as a uh, compensation payment. Uh, this is, makes it distinct from the sin offering. Here are some of the categories of a guilt offering. If you were found guilty of theft of money, violating a Nazarite vow, uh, a cleansing of a skin disorder, a sexual sin, um, misappropriation of temple property, what would be an example of misappropriation of temple property? Maybe one of the Levites and get thirsty and go drink a glass of water out of one of the sacred vessels. Yeah. Uh, denial of debt due to an oath or not sure of a sin is committed, you bring a guilt offering. Uh, I would say that that probably is the most common because you just, there's some things you just don't know what you've done or have or have not done. So, so uh, I would like to ask my uh, designated reader to uh, pick up And start reading with verse 3. If one's offering is an elevation offering from the cattle, he shall offer an unblemished male. He shall bring it to the entrance of the tent of meeting voluntarily before Hashem. He shall lean his hands upon the head of the elevation, 
no libation offering, and it shall become acceptable for him to atone for him. He shall slaughter the bull before Hashem. The sons of Aaron, the Kohanim, shall bring the blood and throw the blood on the altar all around, which is at the entrance of the tent of meeting. He shall skin the elevation offering and cut it into its pieces. The sons of Aaron the Kohen shall place fire on the altar and arrange wood on the fire. The sons of Aaron the Kohanim shall arrange the pieces, the head and the fats, on the wood that is on the fire that is on the altar. He shall wash its innards and its feet with water, and the Kohen shall cause it all to go up in smoke on the altar, an elevation offering, a fire offering, a satisfying aroma to Hashem. Okay, let's stop right there. Elevation offering, this Olah, also there's a little bit more detail that we can add to it. When we talk about unintentional sin, the best way to, to, to describe an unintentional sin is one who has committed intentionally committed a, a sin that there's no real remedy in the Torah about what you've done, right? There's, it's, it's wrong, but there's nothing in the Torah that says here's a punishment for it. So you just, uh, let me think of something that would be wrong. How about maybe uh, me dealing with someone and I am, I, I am real curt with them, and discourteous. Well, there's no Torah law that tells you what the prescription for dealing with that, so you would bring an elevation offering. Why the elevation offering? The sages often will remind us that the elevation offering is about elevating that, that, that sacrifice, bringing it up higher to a shum. When we bring a sacrifice, in essence, we are bringing our yetzeharah, we're elevating our, our, what do you call it, our, our physicality, and we're presenting it to God and putting it on an altar for it to go up higher, to elevate itself. So what is the remedy for someone who has committed something that is not necessarily a sin, or you've not intentionally sinned, but you know what you did was wrong? The best remedy for that is to draw close to Hashem, spend time in prayer. That's what Hitbadadud is about, is personal prayer, spending time with Hashem, just talking to Him, and elevating your soul placing your own desires and your own passions, your own physicality on the altar and allow it to ascend to a higher level. And when we, can, when we picture that in our prayer, it can change the way you, uh, you understand it. So um, Rambam, there, there's a discussion that goes on. It says, uh, there's, a, there's a discussion in Midrash. It says, basically, this offering... Uh, hold that um, uh, that the name of, of sin refers to the sin for which one generally brings the offering it uh, atones for sinful ideas thoughts that come up in a person's mind imagination attitude these are the type of, of offerings that you would bring an elevation offering the uh, Tachuma in Sav, uh, Sav 1 states that it is called Olah because it is, it is superior to all other offerings because it, because it is voluntarily brought and is offered on the altar in its entirety. Our, in other uh, translations, the elevation offering is liter, literal, literal and allows for all of the above uh, connotations. This offering has to be what? Unblemished. The blemish that disqualify an offering are given in the 22nd chapter, verse 17 through 25. The completely healthy state of an offering symbolizes that when a person seeks to come closer to God, he should do so with all of his faculties, not one faculty missing, and also coming in the purest of heart. That's the idea. Now, the next alt offer offering, alt I mean, uh, offering. Okay, Val. If one's offering to Hashem is an elevation offering of fowl, he shall bring his offering from turtle doves or from young doves. The Kohen shall bring it to the altar, nick its head, and cause it to go up and smoke on the altar, having pressed out its blood on the altar's wall. Okay, stop right there. Something's different about this offering. All the other offerings have to be... Um, they have to have the flesh removed, the skin removed from them. The bird does not have to have the skin removed. Sages say the reason why this, this is the case 
is that a person generally bringing a bird is impoverished and they can't afford to bring anything else. And so they'd bring a young turtle dove. It couldn't be a full adult turtle dove. And when they'd bring this turtle dove to, to pluck its feathers off would make it look so tiny. And it would, it would be embarrassing for the person to offer such a small offering, an elevation offering to Hashem. And so out of Hashem's loving kindness, He says, put what you have. And I think this is what's beautiful about this whole sacrificial system is Hashem doesn't require you to offer something that you cannot offer. The sacrificial system is built in such a way that everyone can draw near to God. Everyone can draw near to God. Not a single soul is incapable of drawing near to God. And what's beautiful about this is that we know that from, uh, from the temple service that there were sacrifices that went on all throughout the day. There was morning, noon, and evening. All those sacrifices were for the people. And how, that, how the people would do that, uh, how it was done is each year they would give to the temple whatever their percentage of their tithe was for, for the sacrifices, and that would be purchased by the priest, and then they would offer it up for the people. But those offerings always came, came on behalf of the people. These were called minchas, right? These mincha offerings. But then there were offerings that the people could come and give any time that they wanted to come. If they sinned, the olah. The next is um, the turtle dove was for those who were uh, poor. Continue reading. What verse are you on right now? Uh, 16. Okay. Yes. You shall remove its crop with its feathers, and you shall throw it near the altar toward the east, to the place of the ashes. He shall split it with its feathers. He need not sever it. The Kohen shall cause it to go up in smoke on the altar, on the wood that's on the fire. It's an elevation offering, a fire offering, a satisfying aroma to Hashem. When a person offers a meal offering to Hashem... Okay, let's just stop right there for a second. Mm -hmm. How many have ever <laughs> smelled what feathers smell like when they're burning? It's not very pleasurable, is it? What's pleasurable to Hashem? It's the obedience. It's the it's the elevation of that person's nisham of their soul. That's what that's what he likes. So okay, go ahead. Next, we're going to talk about the meal offering, right? Verse two one. Okay, two one. When a person offers a meal offering to Hashem, he need not sever it. His offering should be of fine flour. He shall pour oil upon it and place frankincense upon it. He shall bring it to the sons of Aaron, the Kohanim, one of whom shall scoop his three fingers full from it, from its fine flour and from its oil, as well as all its frankincense. And the Kohen shall cause its memorial portion to go up in smoke upon the altar, a fire offering, a satisfying aroma to Hashem. The remnant of the meal offering is for Aaron and his sons, most holy from the fire offerings of Hashem. Okay, so uh, the mill offering. The mill offering was for the very poorest individual, person who didn't even have money to buy a bird. But they do have flour, right? They do have meal, and so they could come bring a mill offering. This mill offering, according to Rashi, he says, I will regard it as if, and this is what God is saying to the people who's, who come to him, he says, since it is very inexpensive offering, would be brought only by poor people, God says, I will regard it as if he had offered his very soul. The loving kindness of Hashem to, to extend that to the lowest person is, is amazing. Next, we're going to, did you mention the oil? Did you already read about the oil? Oh, okay. Um, unlike the oil in the menorah, the oil for this offering could be just pressed olive oil. It didn't need to be the highest quality. And of course, we understand that a person who's poor would not be able to afford a high-quality oil. Uh, the volume of meal in this is, it, it, they give a, a phrase called a log, right? Which is equivalent to 12 to 24 ounces of oil, if you can kind of picture that out. There's also frankincense. This is uh, the sap of a tree. Have you smelled frankincense that's freshly burning, how, how great it smells? You can buy the oil, right? I think you can buy the essential oil. But frankincense is just a sap off a tree, and it's crushed. 
and when it's crushed, you can add it into flour and, and all kinds of things. Um, this the the word here for uh, it says the the Cohen cups. There's really no English word to translate the Hebrew for this, but it's just called three finger fulls, right? It's going down and scooping up. That's how much is, is given. The Cohen cups about three middle fingers of his right hand over his palm and scoops up as much of the flour oil mixture in his hand it will hold. His three fingers must be filled to capacity, but one of the mixture, I uh, see, but one, but none of the mixture may poke out from between or outside of his fingers. This amount is called kometz. The act of scooping is known as kometz, komitza. Uh, because there is no English equivalent for this, that's why this, the, it's just called three fingers full. Because who would even know how to even quote that one? Um, mm -hmm. Chometz, yeah. That's yeah, sort of. Huh? Well, this is kometz. Kometz, kaf instead of um, chet. Yes, uh, this is a memorial offering as well. Because the owner finds favor uh, before God through them uh, when they're burned upon the offering. So you can bring a memorial offering of, of this. Um, interesting, God must really like pizza. Well, because there's oven-baked offerings. Two varieties of mincha are included under the heading since the offering baked in an oven may be either loaves or wafers, right? So a person can prepare loaves or wafers, and there was specific Torah law that says how it should be prepared. The loaves are light and fluffy, and the wafers are low and fat. Maybe Hashem might eating all of those offerings meets a low-fat diet. I don't know, but which, uh, which is divided into ten loaves, according to Rashi. Our verses state that they must remain unleavened, and in verse 11 it states that no meal offerings may be allowed to become leavened, but both these breads are kneaded with warm water, which has a tendency to make dough become chemetz, or leavened, correct? Rather quickly. Nevertheless, the Kohenim were so zealous and efficient that they could complete the preparation of the breads before leavening occurred. So you would bring the, all of the ingredients for your meal offering, or to make your loaf, and man, they would prepare it up and stick it on the fire, and there it was. So, um, there's a term used uh, in verse 4, mixed or smeared. If one chooses to use loaves as an offering, the oil is mixed into the dough, and the abundance of the oil uh, helps make the loaves fluffy. In case of wafers, most of the oil is held back to be smeared on the wafer as they are baked. Then there is the pan, the deep dish, uh, <laughs> that is prepared for a shim. And I know we're all kind of getting hungry. It's like a, I want a fired, a fired, oven fired pizza right now. Uh, in which the, the oil is poured into the pan, the dough is put in the oil, and the fire would burn up the oil in the frying process, and the cake would become, you know, it was a flat cake, basically. And it would be fairly hard. He says, you shall break it into pieces, verse 6. This procedure is uh, followed for all cooked and baked meal offerings so that the pieces are small enough for the Kohen to perform uh, the kemitzah. Each loaf or wafer is folded and then folded over again, thus breaking it into at least four pieces. And now we have the deep pan, fine flour with oil, and then there's the one with, a, what's, what's? Supreme. Supreme. Yeah, this is the Supreme, the deep pan. No, this is Chicago-style offering. The deep pan, the pan used for this offering was narrow and deep, and the oil would remain concentra concentrated, and, f and fried offering would be softened. So Rambam adds that the dough was kneaded loosely, so that it did not harden during the frying. Then there is the fine flour with oil offering, although this phrase is first mentioned here. It describes the first step of the meal offering. First, oil was poured into a vessel, and then the flour was poured into the oil. The next step was to, put, uh, to pour oil on the flour and mix them together. Finally, oil was poured in the mixture. So it's a combination of oil and flour together. 
And I, I love this here. It says, who shall bring it close? The commandment applies to all meal offerings of this chapter. After the, the mincha was prepared, the Kohen brought the vessel containing it to the south, southwestern corner of the altar and touched the vessel to the corner. And then it says in verse 9, shall lift up. It says the Kohen has to scoop up the chametz, the chametz, I'm sorry, uh, the three finger, uh, fi fingers full, which would be placed on the altar of fire. As noted above, however, frankincense too was burnt on the altar. And then in verse 11, it talks about uh, fruit honey. Did you notice that term fruit honey, fruit and honey? Let's look at verse 11. Any meal offering that you offer the Lord may be made of leavened dough, uh, leaven dough, for you must not burn leaven or honey as a sacrifice before the Lord. The term honey is not literally honey, but fruit. It's a sweet fruit, like uh, any fruit with a, with a sweet nectar in it, right? Um, which is interesting because you wouldn't know unless we have the oral Torah to tell us this. Um, verse, where are we at? Are we out of... No, it'd be like it'd be like figs. Like you know how you make figs in bread. So, and this is what's pretty cool about all this. Say again, dates, figs, or dates, etc. Yeah. So this is what's really interesting. Is uh, the temple or the tabernacle was in essence the king's palace. It was Hashem's palace, and the this the citizens of the kingdom of Israel came and brought their offerings. And they'd bring food to the king, if you can imagine this. Some of these were big celebrations. Families would get together. They would, because some of the offerings, uh, the Kohen got part of the meat and the family ate part of the sacrifice, but it all had to be eaten right there. So families would come together and sit down. And if it was an off, uh, elevation offering where everything had to be burnt, well, they would come and celebrate a peace offering with the whole family. Or maybe something fantastic's happened. Someone was healed of a terrible disease. So they come to the temple. They offer their offering. And all the family and all the people are there, their friends, and they celebrate together. So this was about connecting with Hashem, dining with the king. Now, think about this for a moment. The greatest thing that we can do is draw near to the king. The greatest thing we can do. How do we draw near to the king in a modern age? There's, there's one way. It's prayer. Now, we can study Torah, but we're actually learning from the king at that point. But our offerings and sacrificial system is our prayer. And with that being said, he's not asking you to spend six hours a day in prayer. He's not asking you to spend an hour a day in prayer. What he's asking you to do is acknowledge him in the morning, and acknowledge him in the evening. You know, if you go to uh, Orthodox shul for prayer, the prayer times, I don't know, maybe 45 minutes sometimes, depends. But the prayers that you pray at your house, they're, they're not that long. How long do you think it takes, Miss Betty? About 30 minutes, 30, 45. Right. If you speed through it, you can go back in 25 minutes, I think. But the point is this. It, it, he's not asking you to do too much. He just wants to connect to you. And we take for granted many times that our sins are forgiven, and oh well, I'll catch up with you next week. But Hashem, Hashem is not interested in you being, or He being your sugar daddy. You know what a sugar daddy is, right? Just in case somebody didn't know. He wants to have a relationship with his people. He loves you. He loves you so dearly. And so the reason why all of these offerings were put in place is because he wanted them to come to him. He wanted them to interact with him. We don't have a temple today. So how do we interact with, with God? Through prayer, study of Torah, doing mitzvahs. How do I truly show and demonstrate, or how do I truly demonstrate to Hashem that I'm sorrowful for the sins that I've committed? Unintentional sins, for example. I go give charity. I find somebody to bless. I find a way to do something that is a great act 
of loving kindness to know, toward another person. I'm demonstrating that I'm willing to sacrifice my time and my effort to do something good for someone else. That's how I bring an offering of elevation to Hashem. How else do I bring an offering of elevation? It's if you know that you, you've done something wrong, you want to vex your soul before God, you cry out, you ask Him to forgive you of your sins, but then you, you commit yourself to so much Torah study every week. To say, Hashem, I'm going to prove to you that I am truly sorry and I'm turning these things around. I'm changing my, my worldview. I'm changing the way I approach all these things. You commit to Torah study. Or commit to doing something that's an act of self-sacrifice to other people. I have one last quote that I wanted to read. If I can find it here in my stack. In Lakuti Sechot, from the Rebbe's talk, Rebbe Schneerson <clears throat> talks about setting the tone for your life. And really this is what it's about. The, at the time of the tabernacle being set up, all the, all the people in the nations were doing sacrifices. What were their sacrifices for? To appease an angry God, right? To somehow conjure up some type of of uh, success. The difference between the sacrifices that the world does and the sacrifice that is required here is that a person comes to Hashem. God wants him to draw near to him. This is about setting a tone. They were given, given a process in which they could connect to God. This was a daily process. So the daily sacrifice was brought twice a day, once in the early morning, once at nightfall, and yet it was referred to as Korban Tamid, the continuous offering. It's considered a continuous offering, even though it was done once in the morning, once in the evening. This implies that the sacrifices brought throughout the day are influenced by the daily offerings. Indeed, for that reason, it was offered before all of the other sacrifices. For this reason, at the beginning of the day, a person makes a total, all-encompassing commit, co commitment to God, saying, Mode Ani, the Mode prayer. I thankfully acknowledge you, living and eternal king, etc., etc., etc. As soon as he rises or she rises in the morning, she thanks God for returning his soul or her soul within her. He refers to God as king, implying that as, be, as befits a commandment, a commitment made to even a mortal king, he will is willing to devote himself with all of his heart, even to the extent of giving up his life. Bringing a daily sacrifice involved the sprinkling of blood on the altar and offerings at its fat on the fire burning there. Blood serves as an analogy for the vitality, warmth, and energy, while fat serves as an analogy of satisfaction. The implication is that a person... Uh, that, that, that a person's day must begin with a firm commitment to devote his or her energy on the altar of God to holy matters, focusing on the holy things of God for, for source of satisfaction, not materialism as a source of satisfaction, but the things of God. God will then help him carry out his resolution, and this will cause the entire day to be filled with blessings. So, what do we do? We set the tone. We get up in the morning, we practice giving offerings to Hashem. And if you will pray in the morning and in the evening, as prescribed, He will consider as if you are sacrificing all day their continual offerings. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. It's not a big commitment. It's just doing it. 